And I'm going to say a very warm welcome to everybody and thank you very much for joining this call today. Um, it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Richard Caffin, who's currently the principal at the International School Telemark in Norway, where he's been for the last 10 years. He's originally from Sussex in the UK, and he's worked in Azerbaijan, Romania, Austria, and Italy. His doctorate is in international uh, school leadership. Richard is nothing if he's not a reflective educator. In our conversations, he's posed questions such as, how can cultural experience and background influence guide us as leaders and managers of complex organizations like international schools? Or for example, how has the pandemic caused us to reflect upon our leadership styles? And how can we effectively support the well-being of staff, students, parents, and ourselves? So Richard, a very, very warm welcome to you. I'm going to start off by asking you a question about the cultural influences that have shaped you as the person that you are today. So, for example, you could start off by telling us about your lovely name, also the countries, the many countries that you've lived in and how those cultures and the schools and educational institutions such as the University of Bath have moulded and changed your beliefs and values and perceptions and cultural sensitivities. Thank you, Sarah. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. And um, I've, I've reflected a lot on some of the questions uh, you've actually, uh, we've discussed already. And um, interesting, my surname is actually very old. Um, it's quite uh, often spelt incorrectly with an I instead of a Y. Uh, apparently it's Norman French and my family, although I come from Sussex, is actually uh, the uh, origins of this name seem to come from North Devon on the uh, edge of Exmoor, which is, uh, if you read um, Lorna Doon, you would know is sort of bandit country. And there's two places there which actually have my surname spelling, which is uh, very unusual. I've actually had a chance to visit it. I did take a picture of myself by a, a name which said Caffin's Cross, which I, I have somewhere. Um, I've lived uh, uh, in various places. Uh, now, presently, I'm in Portugal in southern Norway. And uh, certainly, I think my experiences of um, traveling and living in northern and central eastern Europe have really affected uh, how I am as a person. I also worked a lot in Finland uh, when I was doing some pioneering work with the IB Careers Programme. So I worked at the IB at the University of Bath. And I also taught a long time ago in Denmark for a short time. Um, but all these experiences, I think, have been really pivotal to who I am. I mean, although I'm from England, um, I actually feel not just English. I feel I've actually absorbed some of these other places. And I've certainly found it a fantastic experience to live in different places. And the culture of these places have really influenced me. I think the, the nature of uh, the, the countries I've lived in, the, the sort of aesthetic beauty, certainly the architecture, uh, and the history, the music and folklore have really uh, uh, impacted on and who I am and why I do things as I, I do. I worked at the at Bath for a number of years, uh, and I think that was also really important to actually be out of a school for a while. I worked as a, a head of research support and development for the IB research team. And it gave me a better understanding of what research was and how significant it was in terms of uh, developing and leading educational innovation. Uh, it also helped me uh, work on initiatives and curricula. And I think just that helped me strengthen my understanding of what workplace are, not just a school, but an actual uh, another workplace like a university, the professionalism uh, and the whole focus on lifelong learning, because obviously working in a school um, is one thing, but working in a university, I actually can see education continuing. In fact, we had um, people who were working on the masters and PhDs who were into their 80s. And that was terrific because you actually got to understand that this is lifelong learning and, and bringing that experience further back into schools now as a leader, I think is really, really good. Um, one of the things um, you mentioned about culture is that I try to also uh, use a lot of culture in, in my work uh, as a leader and uh, make, um, I think my office, I try to make a colorful and interesting space. So I use a lot of music 
uh, and play it. Uh, and it, I think that maybe relaxes my mood and relaxes uh, other people when they come in. And I leave the heavier music when I get home. Um, and usually I have to have it on headphones because my family don't like it. <laughs> so I have very interesting and uh, very good taste of music. So I leave Jethro Tull and uh, Bruckner and various other people at home. I don't think I really want to force it on people here. So they have the Mozart and the Baroque on a bit of a loop. <laughs> <laughs> Baroque music is meant to be very good for calming the brain, isn't it? There's a, there's a, a lot of research that's gone into the rhythm and the pace of, of Baroque music being able to um uh help help to bring the brain into a different pacing and uh, it's, it's meant to be very good for concentration isn't it yes i've heard that actually uh, i've chosen specifically certain music which i play in fact i find i used to like uh, a lot of more heavier um music like well not so much heavier but more romantic like sibelius nielsen but i've actually gone into mozart now as a more relaxing um, uh, kind of music and vivaldi albinoni so i play those a lot uh, and i actually find i go back to those and i think the music maybe it's it's a, something to have in the in the one's office and i also like to have pictures up because i think it should be a living place and i, I try and do that throughout the school i do the same at home by the way <laughs> it's not just here <laughs> yeah creating that environment yes <laughs> Excuse me. I, I, I saw, saw some really interesting research many years ago about um, the effect of uh, Mozart, playing Mozart to children who are um, um, suffering from, you know, the difficulties of um, attention span, short attention span, perhaps um, hyperactivity and um, the phenomenal effect that it was ha that it had on um uh, on calming the brain as it were and focusing the brain and um they discovered that it didn't matter whether you play mozart forwards or backwards it still had the calming effect. really i don't know what it comes <laughs> backwards uh, that might be a bit heavy going i've never tried it actually uh, forwards is probably enough <laughs> Lovely, but he doesn't count as being Baroque, actually, does he? He's no, he doesn't. No, no, it's more classical. Post Baroque, um, yeah, yeah. From what I gather, but I, I'm not a, an, an expert in music. I just like I, I've never played. I play a, an Irish baron drum. Yeah, folk. Um, uh, it's often used in folk music in Ireland. But uh, I love this music, and in fact, because I I don't analyze it so much, uh, maybe it becomes more. I take it as more therapeutic rather than over analyzing it, which may be distant to me from the enjoyment. So I'm quite happy to just listen to it. I think it's a lovely idea that you have it in your office, and um, and and it's providing that kind of atmosphere there. I'm gonna um. Uh, move on a little bit to to asking you about your reflections on the on, on the last couple of years and the and, and the impact that it's had. I've had a lot of conversations I mean with yourself in terms of the innovation that and uh, that, that might have come out of the last couple of years and um uh, and and there, there are a number of heads of schools who are really looking for you know some of them talk in terms of wanting to have a revolution um mm. uh really not wanting to go back uh, to things but wanting to hold on to uh what's important but when when, when the focus is still on uh, so what improves student learning and the agility that we've um uh, really demonstrated in education over the last couple of years. So, you know, as a, as a school leader yourself of some time in, in the school that you're currently in, you'll have seen a lot of changes in the ways in which leadership models have developed and, and changed really back over your whole career. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the last couple of years, we've experienced a pandemic which has affected us differently across different cultures and different um, continents. So, what are your reflections on the development of your own leadership styles um, and, and, and how are you leading in a time when many teachers now at the end of this, well, we hope that it's end, we might be in the middle of, who knows, but, you know, mm -hmm. after the last two years of pandemic, um, what, what, what are your reflections on, on the leading, uh, the, your leadership during this time when, as I say, teachers are feeling so tired and fragile at the end of this school year. Mm. Uh, that's um, utterly important, uh, especially now. I think uh, I know people sort of see it as a sort of post-pandemic time. And again, as you say, quite rarely one doesn't know if this is fully the end, one hopes it is. I do feel in terms of reflecting on, on leadership, but it, it needs to stay strong and resilient, which is very tough. Uh, I also think the, the idea of being flexible and adaptable, uh, you have to sort of change with 
what's happening and think very directly, but also be uh, focused in what you do. Uh, I think one has to be very compassionate to people and look at the sort of human touch in dealing with others. So I focus a lot on, on giving time, listening, and trying to also uh, ensure that people balance their work life. So we've really aimed to focus on our core goals, which is teaching and learning and, and well-being, but also get rid of hubris of sort of peripheral issues that get in the way and focus cleanly on what one has to do. But then take anything else that takes impacts on stress that is not necessary and clear that focus. And I think by folks doing that, you also have time to rebalance yourself, re-energize, to relax, to gain energy. So I'm really a strong believer in, in balance and having a very strong balanced work life. And I think you also, as a leader, have to have to walk that. You have to model it. So if you can do that and you can show a lighter touch with dealing with things, bring humor in, as I said, you know, have some music, uh, go out and chat to people, be seen, but also not be looking and trying to see what's going on all the time, but actually just chat to people and uh, ask them things to do with their family, ask them what makes what they've been listening to, what have they been watching on TV. This sort of thing helps because you make it a more personal social place. And, I've tried to do that as much as possible and encourage others to do it. So it's not just one way, it's two way. You want other people to do it to others and show interest. And I think that's that's been done very much. So that lightening of mood, because, I mean, obviously with a pandemic like this and obviously the ongoing issues in terms of Ukraine is causing huge stress to people. And I think one has to read, read balance that and, and give a lightness. So people like to come to work. They can work, they can work in quality ways and they focus on learning, but also they enjoy coming back to work. They're not shattered at the end of the week and realize I've got to work further on this. I could do other things and I feel rejuvenated coming back and I'm not drained all the time. But I think that, that flexibility and that rebalance are essential. Yeah, lovely, thank you. I'm so interested in this idea of um you talk about hubris and um, what you're describing here is actually a personal touch which is about authentic relationships mm. and developing understandings of one another in a personal way and um, this is such an important aspect of the of, of creating a, um, a working environment that uh, that is a, a psychologically safe place to be right yeah mm. and that's you tough uh, I think it's very tough because people come from obviously different backgrounds, they have different fear or vulnerability, and obviously with an international school, people have been away from family. So one has to do as much as one can to actually redress that and try and bring that personal touch and also uh, ensure other people talk to each other, feel that there's a community and a strength together. Uh, and that that's important and not overplay it as well, because sometimes it becomes too um, perhaps heavy for some people, maybe they want more space. You have to judge that as well. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've talked to me in our, our previous conversations about um, the use of data in, in schools. And um, it's interesting um, that, you know, for some people, data feels like um, um, an inaccessible kind of um, um, quantifiable mm -hmm. uh, measurement of, of, of students or how schools are doing and um, <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult to um, find the story within and and yet when you were talking about data it felt uh, about being able to get to know people better and to be able to therefore serve people's you know students needs and so forth so um, just explain a little bit about how you use data to inform uh, mm. your leadership of people, be that the students or the staff or the, or, or the families? Well, I mean, I come from um, part of research strength uh, in terms of background. Therefore, I'm mainly a qualitative researcher. So using interviews and chatting to people, observations. Uh, but also, I think, uh, getting data about what's going on. Uh, so you could do the uh, the sort of uh, that kind of focus in terms of talking, listening to people, uh, keeping an understanding of what's going on, um, observing uh, how things work or don't work. I think that's important. But we also uh, collect quite a lot of data uh, that is quantitative. Uh, so using surveys to find out how um, parents feel and staff and students feel about the school learning and environment. 
Uh, I think that's important. We monitor student performance and we monitor assessment, of course. But I think when you look at data, you certainly look at trends, uh, year on year data we have a lot of, and it's very purposeful. So I always do a survey at the end of the year for parents to ask uh, how do they feel about things so they can judge things on a Likert scale, so one to five. And I do that every year. And then there's more of a qualitative section where they can give opinions. But that sort of data, I can see where trends are coming, where there are exceptions in data, where there are swings. And that is really important to actually reflect on, understand and, and act on, but not over uh, overemphasize data in the sense of having so much data you never even start. So that, that just becomes sort of self-defeating. So I, I do think uh, in using data and information about what's going on, uh, we have quite a lot of ways of being able to monitor uh, how students uh, work, how they behave, uh, their well-being, uh, what sort of issues creates uh, uh, concerns. And then we can go in and say, well, OK, I can see there's a, there's a concern there. We can have a closer investigation and look for direct support, maybe some adjustment a strategy to deal with that. So it's quickly acting on, on certain swings or changes in data and exceptions. Yeah, lovely. I uh, had a conversation recently with Matthew Savage, who's using mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, data to to recognize and notice every child. And um, so from the trends that you're talking about mm -hmm. and how things are working in terms of trends to being able to say um, and, and, and therefore we know every child and we're able to include every child. So it's really interesting to hear your your thoughts there on data. We in actually, in fact, I was just going to say, we actually have um, all the staff have a, um, a conversation with every student in their class twice a year, and they look into well-being issues, and they have a talk with them, and they listen to what they have to say, and they document this, and that is a way of actually monitoring two points in the year, and then that continues to the next year. Does the other any anomalies, any concerns, and they ask them directly, how are you uh, enjoying the school? Are you, is there any problem with anyone? Is there any bullying issues? And these are direct questions. So you can give that student the chance to uh, discuss those issues. And also you can monitor that child. So you can quickly act if you see something that's unusual and you give them that safe space to chat. So you give them time and a voice. And I think that's essential. Lovely, and, and, and that student voice is then uh, presumably what also shapes our planning for um, developing um, new ways and, uh, and, and adapted ways of, of working with the students. Exactly. Um, um, I've been having as, as some conversations with some of the people on the call today about um, mentoring students on a one-to-one -one basis, and it's uh, essentially what you're talking about there, isn't it? And, or, or coaching. Mm so that they're that they're given a voice um rather than talking about students and what's better best for them they're able to um um ha they're empowered to be able to shape uh, some of the ways in which we're working with them I, I, yeah love the sound mm -hmm. of that so now just taking a look um perhaps at at the staff you've talked about your leadership um in in, in these um last couple of years or maybe going back uh, over the years of, of your leadership experience and career. Um, uh, now looking more specifically at, at your staff, at your teachers, your, your educators and, and your support staff, office staff and ad, ad administration. What, what would you, uh, as you reflect back on the last couple of years, what, what do you, would you say are the strengths that you've observed in your team that have enabled them to um, manage this challenging time so well? Yes, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I've been very impressed with how well uh, the staff here and probably in every school have carried on with the uh, kind of professionalism and the dedication to students and their learning. And we've had a, a really great staff here. And I think the important thing is uh, for me to ensure for them to, to work well is to balance for them to balance uh, their work life and to look out for fatigue, stress, and especially vulnerability during this pandemic. So I really try to uh, ensure that we have a strong well-being set up, uh, including uh, our IB coordinators, the leadership, uh, middle management, we have a school nurse, we have an external health agency who work closely with all of us here in the school and people can go and talk to others. We encourage them to talk. 
uh, it's very Norwegian also to have an external health agency. Uh, all the organizations are required to have that. And that's been very beneficial because it means if someone wants to have a, a word with someone external, they have that immediate opportunity. And people have taken that advantage of that, including myself, because, you know, being a leader, you know, you need time to talk to uh, other people to uh, ensure that you feel supported. I think also getting people to talk to each other and listening to them. We have a strong open door uh, kind of focus here and being available in staff meetings and coffee times to, to listen and to chat about various things uh, is important. And try and also, I think, redress, I keep going on about this redressing of a balance. I'm really uh, sort of, I don't know if you know the film Koyanis Guatsi, uh, it's uh, an old film. Uh, it's basically uh, just a huge amount of images. It's an American film. But the music was written uh, for it by uh, the American composer Philip Glass. And it actually comes from a Hopi uh, Indian word, which means life out of balance. That's basically got loads of machines and they're all going completely haywire. And then in the end, it just has this calm music where this rocket explodes. And it's an incredibly profound film. But I'm always taken with the word, and this is a, an old hoppy language uh, from, I think it's New Mexico, this idea of life out of balance. And I keep going back to that. And it's a bit like what we'll talk a little bit in a minute about energy. It's when energy goes down that you have to redress that balance. And that's different from everyone. So I think whatever one can do, and I think I can see also staff uh, really do this very well, uh, differing ways to redress the balance, to be able to focus on the work they need to do, but also to have that time away, a calm time away, to have diversion, to have uh, opportunity to ensure that they can get through these difficult times and have a lightness of spirit, have other things to divert uh, and have good conversations with family as well, because people are isolated. That's, that's critical. If you don't have that and your environment is, is problematic, especially uh, you know, at home if you feel isolated, that will transfer into the, into the workplace, especially for, for all of us uh, students and staff. So anything one can do to ensure it's a positive place, but also readdress that kind of balance. And I think people do it very well in differing ways, but they have, we, we try and work on that all the time to ensure this is a positive social space and that people feel, you know, that they have time that they can in work, but also they can relax. I love that expression, you know, um, when you're talking about life out of balance or redressing the balance and just seeing life in that way. I feel as if I need to have a therapy session with you every week, Richard. Uh, sorry. <laughs> your, team, your, your staff must just come to your school and never want to go away. <clears throat> yeah, it's not always me doing it. I think it's you, you try to do everything you can. I think the staff here are very, very good at doing the same thing. They also encourage people to talk. They, they are there to listen, at, no matter who they are. Uh, and that's important to have those spaces where people feel, well, I could chat to someone about something interesting or you have a conversation about what someone listened to or watched on a film or, or how, how their uh, dog is or, you know, how their mother is or their daughter at university. It's those things which I think are important. So you create, you try and ensure there's a strong uh, family sort of feel to the place, not family as is such, but there's a good communication. And if some people maybe want to distance, that's fine, but then you can engage in different ways. So I think you just keep that kind of communication open so people can use it if they need to use it. In fact, during the lockdown, um, I don't know if you know of a thing called Alpha Stacks, but we, uh, my family and I, because they're all, um, they're all over UK, Norway, and in Spain, or we kept the strong connections through WhatsApp just by having Alpha Stacks, which is we started with books and every day. So we started on the Monday, we started with A and we photoed, photographed all the books beginning with A in our collection or some of them, depending on how many you had. And we sent photos of these and it was really good to communicate with people. Then we did the same with films, music, cities, countries, favourite actors. And we went straight through every month, A to, to Z, uh, X was a bit difficult. And we've done it for over two years. And it really, you, you learn a lot about different people's interests. You show appreciate for their, their views, but it keeps that, that communication alive. And I think it's one of the best things. So as you've, as you quite rightly said, uh, Sarah, 
different play people have done different things. They've kept connections through media, through uh, other ways, and that really is important. So uh, it's worked incredibly well to actually continue that kind of connections and using whatever media you can use to keep alive those strong experiences. In fact, deepen your relationships with people through different ways. Brilliant, I love it. And I, and, and I, you know, I, I, what I'm hearing from you is that if, if as a, a as a faculty or as if as a staff, this is the way that you are creating a culture of balance. Then it's also the way that you're working and interacting with your students. Yeah, modeling, modeling what you're absolutely. You do you do that if you do it with the, the staff. You they are the models. I mean, I'm a strong believer. We model. The IB uh, learner profile attributes. We model our core values of the school. We model being internationally minded. We model all those aspects because we're an IB school, but also global citizenship, the whole um, uh, set of um, international values for why we've chosen this profession. And because we model it, and I have to model that at the top, I have to. Therefore, that pervades to not just the students, but we encourage the students to take that to their families. Because if they've chosen to come to the school, then the families and parents and, the, and their wider connections need to experience that. And I think that pervades throughout the school. And it's creating a culture of care, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I find this so interesting because um, I've read a couple of your um, <clears throat> Uh, academic papers, which uh, also talk about perhaps the other side of, of, um, of the flip of the coin, as it were, that can, can happen in cultures uh, such as international school cultures. Um, but your fascinating uh, paper from 2018, where it, which is entitled The Shadows are many vampirism and the international school uh, and international school leadership problems and potential in cultural, political and psychological borders or so, sorry, psychosocial borderlands. And you, I mean, we talked about this in, in, in a previous conversation and it was completely fascinating to me, your incredible knowledge of folklore and your use of, of this idea of gatekeeping and, and moving across boundaries which is presumably where you get your uh, your wonderful feel for for balance and the need for balance as well but you talk about the importance of understanding cultural contexts um can you can you explore this a little bit with us the vampirism <laughs> i mean i think vampires uh have, i mean i've always liked ghost stories from when i was very young so i quite like to utilize something that's a bit more colorful especially in academic writing now i don't have to write uh, and actually pass a, a degree i have a bit more freedom to be creative so i actually made it more colorful maybe you engage with people in a better way making it less dry so i therefore in this article i used uh, several um, ghost stories, uh, obviously Bram Stoker's particularly one, but others like uh, Sheridan Lafanu and Emma James I'm very keen on. And they have uh, they have vampires in there. They're not really ghosts, they're actually energy drainers. And I've looked a lot into the folklore of this because uh, my first degree was in theology and study of religions a long, long time ago. And I was very interested in what how belief systems start. So coming to that from that angle I thought well and also I lived in Romania uh, for several years and so I have a, a very great interest in the deeper sort of belief systems especially in Eastern Europe that make people make people sense of of nature of life of death and uh, to create such structures such um, creatures in a sense uh, if you ask me if I believe in vampires and I say I would because actually a vampire is something that drains energy it's uh, and it has to be counted and it really is a, a metaphor uh, and it's a good way in this article to actually just understand how things that actually um, drain energy in organizations can impact deeply uh, a lot of my research when I, I did work on uh, my doctorate was focusing into these energy draining uh, issues whether they were uh, people or context or locations or even the building or an environment or certain events they could uh, you know they could um, innovate catalyze things but they also they could be damaging and I think as a head and a leader you need to have a strong knowledge of the these kind of dynamics in a school and also within your community so you know what's going on 
because your, your school is not isolated from a wider community, whether it's mainly expat or local, there are pressures and impacts that come into the school play out. And I found that it really in the, the years I did the research, um, very powerful. And in back to the borders idea, um, I think that that came out of the research and I developed that further on. The actually the borders are very important. Being an international school and being international, I mean, all of us travel through international borders, through airports, ports, whatever. So you actually get an understanding all the time you're going across a border. And in the school, uh, it could be, a, it's a physical border, but there's social, there's cultural, there's political, there's psychological borders, there's borders of control and who has power in a particular area. And you're always constantly interacting and going across those borders. And that dynamic, especially in an international school with all the multicultural, with the rich communities, but also the subcultures, the ex different experiences, the fears, they can be very powerful and people react to these. And I think you need to understand fully what is going on in terms of a psychosocial, psychosomatic aspect to a school to be able to not just gatekeep these boundaries, but actually watch who has access. Uh, who do you have an incursion across a boundary? Is there a particular issue? Because it usually is a boundary issue, uh, and that I think is is really important to have a good understanding of and be aware of. So have your finger on the pulse of the kind of social things going on in the school, and understand that you can see well if something spikes, maybe there's a, a an issue in terms of boundaries. Something's crossed. Something's there's a power issue, or there's someone who's misunderstood something. Uh, or there's a cultural uh, concern, uh, often can be cultural misunderstandings, or people who've experienced something elsewhere and bring that baggage and play it out in the school. Uh, I'm often a believer if I see something particularly to uh, maybe a parent, it's not actually to do with the school, it's to do with a domestic issue, but it plays out, especially in the small confines of an international school. That can be very uh, powerful and impact, and it could be very damaging. And therefore, you have to be incredibly aware. So I think when I go look at vampires, much as I like to just read about vampires and, and the whole idea of what a vampire is, it really is the idea of energy draining. Uh, you know, I don't actually believe per se that, you know, people are dressed up like a, a Dracula and, and sort of knock around in, in, in Transylvania. Uh, but I actually believe very much in the idea of a vampiric thing with drains. Yeah, it's so interesting. And so what, again, by recognizing you can be intentional and um, and, and, and so your exploration of, of space and creating enriching physical zones, mm. you nurture mood. And you talked about your pictures earlier on and you said that you've taken them down off the wall because you've been uh, uh, decorating recently, but that, that having, having imagery um, and, and being married to an artist, this is something that's very dear to uh -huh. me. <laughs> music playing in your room and and so forth but you know creating that and nurturing that mood for enhanced mm. learning um would be very interesting for us to hear more about can you can you just describe to us uh, as um uh what, this one aspect that you talked about which was your wonderful um ideas gardens that you have in the international school of telemark tell us about that uh intentional um, energy giving space rather than energy draining space. Mm. Well, as we were talking a little bit earlier, um, sir, about the environment of a school, I think, uh, and that obviously impacts on well-being. And if you've got a good environment, a positive, pleasant environment, no matter where you are, uh, that will directly impact on how you do your work. There's no question. The same with home as well. In fact, the Ideas Gardens uh, came from a visit to the Toronto Public Library with my family three years ago, just before the pandemic, in fact, 2019. Uh, my family are partly Canadian. Uh, I'm the only person who isn't Canadian in my family, unfortunately. Uh, but we were in the public library because my wife is a librarian. And uh, she particularly wanted to go back to it because she, she was born in Canada and she wanted to see the library because she, she knew it well from a long time ago. And they have a, an idea, uh, they have a garden there. Uh, it's called an ideas garden, if I remember it rightly. And what it is, is, is a place where you can sit and read. And obviously in a library, you need those sort of spaces, but they've actually used plants. There's a wall of plants as you go into the library, but also this ideas garden or this reading garden. 
And so they actually have these plants. So you have a very green space, which I think is really important. Obviously, we haven't mentioned the whole idea of ecological issues and the green issues and climate change, which, you know, with what's going on in, in Ukraine and what's going on in the pandemic, the climate change issue, I think, is is has been sitting in the background, but it is actually appallingly uh, dangerous for the whole uh, world and it's one that actually sits in the background but it is very dangerous and we have to make sure our students understand the importance of green industry. Norway is very focused on this and this part of Norway uh, has a, a very strong focus now on green energy. In fact the American ambassador came to see this uh, the industry park here in Porsgrunn at Heroya and visited our school afterwards uh, and uh, I chatted to her a lot because I'd lived in Baku in Azerbaijan and she lived in Georgia in Tbilisi and so I know Georgia pretty well so we chatted a lot about Caucasus things which was rather nice uh, but she focused very much I'm very pleased that we had such a green focus and we looked and thought well how much connection do we have in terms of developing this? so the ideas gardens we have used plants they are quiet spaces, they have relaxing sofas in the colour of the garden, and we also have artwork. Um, and really we have three ideas gardens and they reflect the different colours of this area of Norway. So we have red for mountains, blue for water, as we have the sea, we have lakes, we have a canal which is very famous, and also green for forests. So we use that, we use our logo in a creative way in the design of these ideas gardens. So they are accessing social space right off corridors and they're sort of alcoves more than anything. And they have colours, they have window decals to match the colour and the style of the particular garden. And they're used hugely by students for work, for projects, for independent study, for group discussion, for meetings. Uh, we aim to further develop these because I think they're an ongoing process. We probably need to put more plants in there, really, and have it more green. But they are, well, I, I saw that so well used in Toronto, and I saw that we had space in the school, and it was good space, but it hadn't got a name. And I thought from that I could use it effectively here. So we have these three gardens, which are really about using space cleverly and actually making it less institutional making a softer space where people can feel relaxed in. And again, if that helps them work and it helps the quality of their work and their interaction with others, mm -hmm. then that's exactly what I'm aiming for here, you know. Yeah, you're back to your balance again. And yeah, exactly, yeah. Wonderful. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to finish off with the last question um, from my side, which is um, to, to bring the students and, and their learning to the focus. Um, and perhaps I could, ask you about the why of the International School of Telemark that you that you lead um, and then about how you encourage student leadership within your school. How how are the students in your school driving change in learning? I th just to take the first part uh, about the why, uh, I think one has to keep focusing on the core reasons the school is here. So we are as our core goal is is quality student learning and well-being and we I, I focus on those and if there's something comes along which is not part of that you have to question why it's being done so I think that's, it's like anything if it was if it was an Italian restaurant uh, you would focus on it's an Italian restaurant that's what it is so it's not going to do something else it's not going to sell potatoes or something it's a that's what it is so we focus on what the reason we are for being here and also we're an international school we're an IB school, uh, we're focused on international education, so we encourage all those core values uh, of what an international school is. So we have uh, strong values of reliability, responsibility, respect and resilience, and those permeate everything. But back to the other part of the question, how do students drive change? Well, we model these behaviours and we also, we always encourage and ask the students to do the same thing, to show respect, to expect that in return. So they are actively involved in those core values and they're expected, but they're also very involved in leadership and change. There's a student council, obviously, but also there's a student rep at the board meetings. Uh, they're involved in class management. Uh, the, all the classes have essential agreements throughout the school. Uh, but also for their own class and what are their expectations and the children of uh, students 
are part of this. They have a very strong voice. And that's part of what Norway offers, uh, that students have a voice and they are there to be respected, but also to respect others. So we develop that and give them agency uh, to develop and have opportunities to, to grow, to take leadership. I'm a strong believer in collegial collegiality, but also distributed leadership. And that doesn't just go for staff, it goes for students as well. Where one can, you, you have those, that respect and that opportunity for students. Uh, and I do the same for my own children. I think if you, you treat them like adults, you treat them with respect, you encourage that, that will come back to you and you're preparing them for life. You're preparing them for uh, further education, but also relationships. And if you can actually let them lead and let them take the maturity uh, to go forward, to actually develop those ideas and to be trusted and to be pulled up if they don't do certain things and actually have a consequence. And that's important to act on those things. Then I think you're giving them a huge service for the future. And that's, that's very important indeed. Thank you. We had our we were, we were delighted to be able to have our face to face leadership conference this year in St Albans, and um, it was very important for us to have some students um, presenting. And uh, you know, rather it, than it being a kind of a patronising, isn't that sweet that the that, that the students got to say something? Um, mm. It was really an incredibly powerful presentation that they gave. There were a couple of ninth graders from the International School of Helsinki. And it was astounding how often in other presentations over the course of the two, two and a half days, other people quoted them and, wow. um, and that they were, um, they were, you know, what they had to say was important. And so um, it's so lovely to hear that what you're doing in, in, in your school and, um, in, and through your leadership um, is, is really respectful of um, colleagues and uh, students and parents in a way that, you know, is describing um, the way that you paved the way for people having a balanced um, um, way of working in the school. So I'm, I, I'm going to sort of draw this to a, a close now with a huge thank you to you for um, sharing um, these, these really important aspects of your leadership, which is so inspiring and empowering. And um, we'll be hearing more from you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, for today and thank you for um uh, those people who were joining the call and um will be record this has been recorded and so we'll be putting it on the um uh, media archive of the uh, ecis website richard thank you very very much for your time today thank you very much indeed sir and uh i'm really pleased to have been able to uh, chat to you and it's uh it's um you know, good experience for me as well to reflect on what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm always very pleased to be able to take part in these kind of uh, initiatives. And I think it's a very powerful one. I've actually had the chance to see other uh, podcasts like this. And I think they are very, very important. So and it's been an utter pleasure. So thank you. Thank you.